Yo, it's Joe and welcome to another video. Uh, today I want to check out a video that I saw on my recommend. It's called I Can't Get Over How Good EXU Calamity Was. And I just got finished watching it, as you guys know. I need to finish up the wrap up, but I've seen Calamity. I thought that it was amazing. Uh, you guys know towards the end, it was hidden. It was definitely hidden uh, for me, at least. And I'm sure for all of you guys that saw it as well. But I want to see this video because... I want to see if this person is able to put into words uh, what I may not have been able to, and uh, maybe I can expound upon that. Uh, but uh, either way, I think I'm going to, I think I and all of us are going to agree with what this man says in this video, but let's just see what he says. And uh, yeah, I'll leave the link to this original video in the description. If you haven't seen it, please check it out. Please support this person. Okay. They're going to be linked in the description this video. Give it a like, comment, all that stuff. All right, so without further ado, let's see what this bad boy is about. He pulls the back of your head and rips the skin off of your skull. <sighs> yep. Yeah, that part was crazy. That part was crazy, bro. When he was flying with, um, because that was at that point, that was Asmodeus, right? That was crazy. I am traumatized. In all the best ways. <laughs> I want facts. In all the best ways. In all the best ways. <clears throat> In all the best ways. <laughs> I watch a lot of D&D &D content. Barring the occasional one shot or side quest, I've seen basically every episode of Critical Role and Dominion. Oh, so this guy knows. Also Damn, this guy knows a lot of stuff, huh? To hundreds of episodes of podcasts like wow. the Adventure Zone and Not Another D&D podcast. But I can say with confidence that my favorite Let me know if I should check out some of that stuff. Unlimited calamity. And it's not close. Wow. The cast was on wow. their Wow, that's, that's glowing. For a guy who said that he's seen all this stuff and it ain't even close. Like everything else that he's seen doesn't come close to calamity. It says a lot about how much he likes calamity. I mean, calamity was... I kept saying it throughout my whole reaction. It was a masterclass. I will say that. The production design was great, <clears throat> the music and the lighting and the overlay was all fantastic. But on a mm -hmm. deeper storytelling level, how exactly did they achieve this? How did they make something so good? Well, that's also something I want to bring up real quick, real quick. And I always say it, but for real, we cannot sleep on the people that did what they needed to do in order to create a the atmosphere with the music, the lighting and all that stuff, man, you can't sleep on the cast and crew that's behind the scenes that we don't see. Well, let's dive in <clears throat> and find out how. The tone was set immediately. Bro, that's what I'm, bro. That's what I'm saying. I said that immediately. So for those of you guys who don't know, I reacted to it. You can see episode uh, oh, part one to episode one and the whole basically series of my reaction to it on the channel but i said that immediately that the tone was immediately set there's no breaks at all it was immediate everything feels slow and just the way that running there's uh movement and there's heat like you can tell he's thinking about exactly what to say and how to say it is meticulous hear, despite all this chaos is breath even if you have no knowledge outside of this series as to the lore of critical role <clears throat> and what the calamity is you can kind of get a feeling as to what it's supposed to be by the first like five minutes of this series bro outside quicker than that you get it within the first the couple first of minutes word <clears throat> spoken in this series is fire human beings have a deep primal connection to fire Oh, that's destruction. good. That's a good connection. Incarnate, I wasn't thinking about life, that. That is, is very energy, true. But most of all, it is to be feared. What follows is the introduction of our first player character, Xerxes, played by Luis Carrazo. And he has to introduce his character with the knowledge that his mouth is filled with blood. We very quickly mm. learn that Xerxes, in Brennan's words, is not doing well. He hasn't seen... <laughs> not doing well is an understatement. There's fire everywhere... There's blood in his mouth. Everything is slowed and it's weird. This was crazy. And you know what? Now that I think about it. Wow. You know what? Now that I think about it. Isn't it funny how what's being described here with everything being slowed and 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 kind of like uh, ethereal in the way that it is. Um, 
it's kind of like the final battle when Osmodeus, As, uh, Osmodeus, because I keep I keep calling him the you know the horned one and uh, uh, um, you know the betrayer god and all that stuff. But you guys have said in the comments it's a it's Osmodeus, uh, Osmodeus. Um, he's uh he does he does this thing when he comes out and everything slowed down. There's fire everywhere. It's Xerxes is also not doing well, and it. I think it's funny how like it's mirrored. Everything is like mirrored. I didn't even think about that. And that's part of his dream that kind of like foretold things to come in a way. And it's crazy how that kind of went full circle. I just realized that. Interesting. Seen his son. Another reason why it was so good. In years. And I wonder if that was planned. If I know Brennan, if I know Matt, that was planned. And we learn really quickly that his husband is dead. <clears throat> and then following that, we see an all-out brawl between two gods. One who's referred to as the Dawnfather, which is typically seen as a good deity, and the other one who looks kind of like Asmodeus, or in Critical Role, uh, the Lord of the Hells. Asmodeus? Is, is how you say it? I thought it was Osmodeus. <laughs> so yeah, Asmodeus, but I was correct. Who looks kind of like Asmodeus, or in Critical Role, uh, the Lord of the Hells, who is usually associated with evil. But Xerxes mm -hmm. sees the Lord of the Hells being beaten by the Dawnfather, and he feels for him. And even mm -hmm. though aesthetically we can see mm -hmm. who is evil and who is good, <laughs> Xerxes feels for the Lord of the Hells, and he hints that there might be more to this story. And I think that that's like... So I started to watch the wrap-up, right? And like, so um, Lewis talks about this, how when he was creating Xerxes and, you know, in that whole moment, Xerxes kind of sees part of himself in the betrayer God in uh, Asmodeus. And uh, <laughs> it's so crazy, bro, how <laughs> I can fix him. I thought it was initially, oh, let me just help him. Nah. Bro said, I can fix him. Don't you worry. The literal Lord of Lies. I know it's Lord of Hells, but it's the Lord of Lies. And he trusts him the whole way through. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy what Pride will do to him, man. He he thought that he, he could fix him and he was, you know, untouchable and everything he did was righteous and nothing could get in the way of him because the righteous path is like the right path, even though he was... Uh, he had a couple screws loose, obviously, right? And he wasn't the nicest person out there. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's just funny. That shit's just funny. He's like, nah, Lord of Lies, don't worry, brother. That don't, that don't even matter. I could still fix you anyways. <laughs> it is an intense opening. We get hit with a lot really quickly, especially in D&D &D terms. It sets up mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that we need to know going forward, but also foreshadows the destruction down the road. We learn a lot very about good Xerxes point. See, that's what I said too. as well as just very his good past point. and history. And we also learn that something big is going down between the gods. And that sets up a lot of the plot stuff. However, it does something even more important. With the intensity of that introduction, we can now all feel the Sword of Damocles dangling above our heads, ready to swing. But then, Brennan does the something sort of Damocles. wonderful. I don't get he that makes you reference. forget it's there. Tragedy mixed with humor. Outside of the beginning and the end, the first episode <clears throat> is really fun and funny. It, feels it a lot is like very a typical fun. Dimension 20 episode. We get extensive introductions into each character and the worlds they live in, as well as we get some plot hooks and we get some intrigue. But the <laughs> it is funny, and uh, it's cool that we... Like, somebody like me who didn't really know much about, like, the characters and the lore even had fun. But, like, the players themselves were having fun, too, because they got little Easter eggs. Uh, one thing in particular that I thought was super cool was Pravon. Pravon's in this, and I kind of put two and two together. Like, oh, this is the Matron's Champion that we saw in the second season of the show of The Legend of Vox Machina. For those of you who don't know, if you're new here, I haven't seen any of the campaign really aside from the first episode, a little bit of it. Um, so I'm mainly a TV <laughs> a show watcher, whatever you want to call it, the animated series. And um, to be able to put two and two together and 
for the people in my comments and everybody to explain exactly who that was and to verify it for me. I, I was like blown away, like, oh, this world building is great. But it was fun for the players because from what I understand, it was like years before they even really heard of this guy's name because what that was years ago, right? Like back in what, like 2015, 2016 or something. Uh, so to have, to have uh, somebody with like such legendary status appear in this lore and also when he's like prior to him being at that status that we recognize him uh, for is also really interesting. Um, so I just had fun getting the lore and the intrigue there, but there was Pravon, there was uh, Sam and Laren's, uh, you know, their their relationship, you know, um, tried to act like they didn't like each other, but you could, you could tell even at the beginning that they still had a soft spot for each other at least. Um, Sarah talking to uh talking to his kids and everything and that funny walkie talkie you know wingspan and all that stuff um I just thought that there was like a lot of fun there um and uh like you said there was like a lot of intrigue a lot of mystery and coming off of also something that was so like just like I don't know how else to describe it other than um claustrophobic feeling that that intro gave you to something like that like it was just such a good roller coaster of emotions but a good balance and it was seamless and everybody did a great job balancing off each other to help the story flow in the way that it did the thing that stands out we get lots and lots of jokes so why this story is very clearly set up to be a tragedy so Still why gotta are have we spending some so much time joking around well there are some very very good reasons for that one of them I think it is to help us relate to the people. It is to help us let our guard down and forget exactly how serious things are for a moment. So that when those moments happen where it's like, oh shit, there's a Hamadad in the room. Or when that whole Gordranis situation happens, when it's the one Hamadad that just like, what is it? It turns to, I think, what is it? Pesha, right? And it's like Gordranis and it just drops, right? Like the little moments like that of, of where you kind of snap back to reality hit even harder because it's interspersed or those moments are interspersed between moments of like brevity and comedy and like intrigue that isn't so serious. It's just a little more interesting, right? That's what I think. But it also helps to relate to the characters, care for the characters, bond with the characters in a way. Um, <laughs> you're going to at least feel some way about the characters. Uh, you're definitely not going to be bored of them. But you're either going to like them, hate them, you know? And uh, I think that's a big reason why they did that. Um, is that it's Let's going see to make the eventual says. tragedy hit a lot harder. Yes. One, it endears us to the cast and the characters. Bro. Humans are, by nature, playful. And me we and this guy, me and this guy. Serious nature. And if other people can make us laugh or laugh with us, we are far more likely to mm -hmm. enjoy their company. So all these jokes and funny character dynamics serve to make us like the characters more. So when all the bad stuff starts happening, it's going to hurt more. Mm -hmm. Two, it makes us a lot more comfortable. In fact, I think it makes us too comfortable. And that's the point. In fact, Lou kind of points this out at one point during the first episode. Remember when we started with the scariest thing in the whole world? Yeah, yeah. And that scene like, kind of forgot <laughs> yeah I do remember that part. The show yeah, yeah, yeah. Is making us forget that that sword is dangling right above all the characters' heads the whole time. So when it this goes to show how good Brendan is with his uh, GMing and DMing and moving the story along at a good pace. Finally, comes down. It's going to surprise us even more. It is far easier to make somebody cry if they're already laughing. Brennan knew exactly what he this was doing. This is true, he man. He had a laser focus on the comedy mixing with the tragedy, which also feeds a little bit into my next point. It had mm -hmm. a theme. Few stories <coughs> told through the medium of Dungeons and Dragons and other tabletop RPGs have themes. Because themes require focus. And generally, yes, that's do. not really something D&D players have. So before it continues, I just want to say that I think the theme of Calamity um, is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I said it multiple times in my reaction in the series as I'm watching everything happen and the choices that these characters are making. But it's literally like we all know that they're not going to make it out of this, 
You know, we all know that. I mean, I was shocked to see by the grace of the dice, you know, and luck, Sarah make it out. But we knew that things weren't going to be sunshine and rainbows for anybody regardless. Um, and I think that in order for you to... <clears throat> I think that in order for you to make a gripping story like this and for you to have the the road to hell is paved with good intentions with characters like this, with the preset storyline that we know that this is how it's going to happen, I think was the perfect thing to have. But I just think that that was the theme in general. And like I said, these characters, in order for this theme to be what it was, they couldn't have been perfect. They had to have been flawed. And I said multiple times during my reactions that I didn't like them. But how do you think that we were going to get to such a calamitous, uh, if that's even a word, ending uh, if these characters weren't the way that they were? You know, it had to be that way. There was no other way it could be. But it fit the thing perfectly, Those the way that they made their characters behind the scenes talking to Brennan and everything like they did such a good job to help make this hit so hard with the theme and that's not a dig well, that's what just I think an the observation theme is. of the medium before Alexandria <laughs> Unlimited was even a thing we learn a little bit across the critical role campaigns about the calamity and how it was caused by people's hubris so the story is hubris. basically just that's, Jurassic Park forgot that's the word hubris you guys tell me in the comments dinosaurs. all the time hubris people, hubris including it's the hubris. creators of wildly popular tv shows seem to think that theme isn't particularly important when it comes to storytelling oh theme is I everything i disagree very strongly especially when it comes to shows like calamity bro if you don't know what your theme is if you don't know what your theme is you're gonna become kind of scatterbrained with your plot and not just your plot, but you're not going to be able to properly balance the moments of comedy and tragedy and, and, and joy. And, and you're not going to be able to properly balance that if you don't have your foundation of a theme. Your characters aren't going to be able to, I don't know, you're, I feel like you're just not going to be able to cater your characters to a story that doesn't have a theme. Because that's what you have fun with. At least I would think when playing D and D, if you kind of get a vibe of what the theme is, you can cater your characters and your actions around that to have a little more fun, to make things a little more interesting in a way that makes sense. But if you don't know what your theme is, it might not make sense. Themes are there to make us think, to challenge our preconceptions, to make us feel, and to provide the only value that really matters: meaning. You probably know what it feels like yes, sir. when you experience this guy is a piece of art that makes you right feel now. like it matters in some way. For me, it's either a sense of quiet satisfaction or an internal roller coaster. There's no in between. It's one of the two. Either way, it is one of my favorite feelings personally. And judging by the way Calamity was received, I think a lot of people would agree with me. On top of that, oh, a hundred percent, dude, hundred percent. Game even starts can keep the cast and the DM just everybody at the table on the same page. Everyone at the clam. This guy is spitting, but that's exactly what I said. That's exactly what I said, though. Listen to him again. Agree with me. On top of that. Having a pre-existing theme before the game even starts can keep the cast and the DM, just everybody at the table, on the same. Page. Yes, sir. Everyone See? Everyone at the Calamity table is a storyteller in one sense or another. They all understood yo, this the guy, roles yo, this guy knows. they were playing. This guy they knows. They all understood the assignment. <clears throat> when Abria cast Blight on that tree at the end of episode three, I knew that this cast was dedicated, especially dedicated to their characters bro and i said this throughout the whole reaction that i couldn't stand for the most part the characters that they played but man i love the way that they played them like i love that their characters were the way that they are though if that makes sense like i didn't like them but i loved that even if they knew okay this might end well or this isn't something that i would personally do they knew this is what my character would do. We in there, let's do it. And they stuck to the script. They understood the assignment. They stuck to the assignment. And they aced the assignment.
especially Abria. Brennan actually tweeted about the show saying, Bro, I t bro, this guy knows. This guy knows. Uh, it, you, you guys are, if you guys don't know, I was basically giving Abria her flowers throughout this whole reaction of the whole mini campaign. She did a phenomenal job. And that Abria was the embodiment of understanding the assignment. Oh. And I wholeheartedly mm -hmm. agree. But I would also extend that to the entire cast. It yes. 100%. Her and Xerxes especially. Her and Xerxes especially. <laughs> I gotta say, everybody else, they stuck to character. They did their thing. They did their part. But... I think that I like I think that they were all dedicated, but I think that the lengths that Abria and Xerxes uh, that Abria and Lou uh, Abria and Lewis, Jesus Christ, that Abria and Lewis went through or went to to make sure that they made choices that their characters would make in scenarios where it probably wouldn't have even benefited them and they might have even knew it. And it might have not even benefited their party. But they knew it's what their characters would have did. And they did it. Those two in particular, I think. Because their choices were ultimately, in my opinion, the choices that led to calamity the most. I think that those two characters are the most responsible for the calamity that happened. If you disagree, you could say it in the comments. You can let me know. I don't know. Again, everybody did their job. Everybody was dedicated. But I think that they were the most important ones because they were dedicated to making sure that it worked out right as it should have went for the calamity. For $1, you could have seen this early and gotten these other perks too. So become a member for just $1 is worth it. Especially Abria, Louise, and Travis. All of their characters made excellent decisions in terms mm -hmm. of storytelling that were Travis is, Yeah, Travis did his thing too. Mm -hmm. well, well, we'll add Travis to that as well. I mean, especially with that ending. But, uh, yeah, Travis did his thing. His moments with his family, me personally, most emotional ones. Decisions in terms of gameplay. And that made the show so, so much better. The things that I really, really loved that those characters did were Xerxes' passionate and ill-advised attempt to redeem the Lord of the Hells, <laughs> Saren's decision I to can straight fix up him. leave the party to make sure his kids were okay, <clears throat> and Laren's absolute maddening obsession with trying to get her project done and removing any and all obstacles that were in mm -hmm. her way. All of these decisions feed into the nuance and the heart of the story. Everyone was willing to make suboptimal story decisions. Yep. To Dude, make this guy knows. I love better. this video. And this is a great video, guys. Really like check check this video out. It's great. Suboptimal decisions for the sake of that's what my character would do. But if it is making the game a stronger story, then I'm all for it. In a regular game of d and I don't think those decisions would have worked very well. But because this series is short, they only had four episodes, mm -hmm. they didn't have to worry about long-term consequences. Also, they didn't really I mean, worry about their... I mean... What happened at the end of the, uh, at the end of this little mini campaign, uh, uh, the consequences were pretty, uh, the ramifications were crazy, <laughs> but I see what he's saying. Like for them while they were still around, they didn't have to worry about anything that was, uh, uh, long-term. This would have worked very well, but because this series is short, they only had four episodes. They didn't have to worry about long-term consequences. Also, they didn't really have to worry about their characters surviving because this campaign ends with the beginning of the calamity. They all knew what kind of story they were telling. And part of the reason they were able to achieve this is because they had extensive pre-game conversations about their mm -hmm. characters, their past relationships, and that's something and I found their out ideal uh, arcs. In, in the, the uh <laughs> in the wrap up or the little bit that I saw, I didn't even know that that happened. They had like meetings and everything, dude. Like it was crazy. And Travis was like left out of it sometimes because his character, it, like Sarit, couldn't have been in the know for certain plot details. If if I'm not mistaken, that's why. Um, and it, it, that's like a behind the scenes dedication. That's like behind the scenes dedication to making sure that everything was going to be as authentic as possible 
when this joint uh when this joint was being made with all of them in the you know their sessions wrap up video for calamity they talk about all the conversations and meetings oh uh, yeah and dude he says it right here had. Mm -hmm. it seemed like it was a lot but that was one of the reasons they were able to keep this so tight and focused mm -hmm. they had a meeting for all the players who wanted to be quote yeah this guy nasty. Yep, 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 and yep. louise and brennan had a lot of conversations about yeah how nasty wanted xerxes to interact with the betrayer gods and it was all laid out from the start but not in a way that was like railroady. It sounds kind of like a TV mm -hmm. writer's room breaking the story before they actually start writing the series. Yeah, this and series it, it, was... I think that that is another thing that helped them to elevate and understand the assignment, understand what their roles were, and let them kind of sit by themselves and think, okay, because of this, because we had this meeting and because of what was discussed, I want to take my character in this direction or maybe they weren't going to take their character in a certain direction but because of something that was discussed they were like you know what no you know what i'm i'm, I'm, I'm gonna go in this direction you know like I, I think it helped them like kind of uh with with their with their resolve and like their path even more so i think that was such a good idea i don't know if that happens as like super often in the campaigns you guys can let me know like i know that there are what like a either home campaigns or like um you know as far as critical role goals like with i think what is a campaign one or two um the uh you know the cast will consult the gm which at that point is matt and say hey listen this is what i want to you know because of maybe something that had happened with their character in a previous uh, uh session or whatever hey do you think that i can take my character in this direction and you know the next section the next session if the story goes in this way like you know and um i think this is like i said great idea it's a good thing to do it was genuinely breathtakingly good for all the reasons i laid out and i'm sure dozens upon dozens more i had such a good time with it i i laughed i cried and i also felt a lot of tension and suspense how can you create just suspense in your D and D table? This guy looks like he's got some good videos, man. I think I'm gonna have to <laughs> gonna have to subscribe to this guy, honestly. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Want to learn how to use tension suspense in your games? Click the video on your screen right now. Huh. Thank you. I think maybe this guy was a GM or two, uh, once or twice, maybe. You know. Thank you for watching. Please leave a like, subscribe, and hit the. Yep. Yep. Yep like and subscribe um i'm gonna leave like i said before i'll leave the link to this video in the description but definitely give him some support if you haven't seen it already all right guys that was my reaction to i can't get over how good exu calamity was um if you made it this far please leave a like maybe subscribe and if you are not a channel member yet become one for just a dollar literally just one dollar you get to see my reactions to things like this early and you get other perks. But anyways, if you're interested in my thoughts, that's going to be right now. There's nothing that this guy said in this video that I wasn't already either saying or thinking or going to say. <laughs> um, I think that this was a phenomenal video and he definitely was able to put into words in a succinct way how I felt about the series. Like I was saying it all along, but like all of his points that he made were literally exactly why i loved the the calamity uh series of videos because you could tell just so much care went into it again not even just the cast that we see on the camera but the people behind the scenes behind the camera um they helped like they they everybody was 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 on point so they were on point but the cast and crew that we do see on camera were also on point Brennan was a phenomenal DM and helped to pace the story and uh, take you on that emotional roller coaster and guide you through that beautifully with the different themes and the different story beats uh, that we got. Um, and then the characters bouncing off of each other and to help to um, add on to Brennan's GMing and Brennan, even uh, the one thing that uh, this guy didn't mention in this video that I want to point out actually right now is the amount of freedom that Brennan gave them and the amount of times he said, well, what do you think this person would do or how do you want to do this? Or, you know what, I'll allow this thing, you know, go ahead, go for it and we'll see what happens. 
um, he really worked with them in a way that was very um, normal, very, I, I don't know what the word is other than normal, but uh uh it was just it was just smooth it was smooth everybody was so smooth with their roles um and you know they stuck to the theme they worked so hard on their characters and interacting with each other the improv was great but um like i said they even stuck to what their characters would do when it comes to this theme when it comes to the story even if they themselves didn't agree with what should be done uh, or what their characters would do. They knew that their characters would do these things at the end of the day, and they were all super dedicated. Again, uh, Abria and Lewis were the uh, most dedicated, in my opinion. Um, Sarit had great moments with his family, or not Sarit. Um, I'll say Travis had, you know, great moments with his family and how he played Sarit. But the but the thing with Sarit is that Sarit was the one that I think. We could relate to the most as far as his moral compass i guess um but laren and xerxes's actions a lot of the time i wasn't <laughs> was not in agreement with them or their attitudes at all um but abria and lewis we're dedicated to making sure that the story played out in the best way that it should. Even if they disagreed with what was going to happen, they still made sure that those things happened. And, uh, yeah, I think that because they were, or their characters were the ones that caused the calamity to happen the way that it did, I think that their dedication was the most important. And they did it flawlessly, and it was the most impactful in my opinion. Um, and yeah, Brennan, like I said, did a great job. Uh, Lou did a great job with Nidus. I'm not leaving Lou or Sam out at all. Um, I'm not leaving Marisha out at all. Everybody did their parts perfectly, but I'm just talking about, uh, I'm talking about who I think their actions were the most impactful. I think, um, but yeah, everybody bounced off each other well. Everybody played their part well. Great story. Um, great behind-the-scenes prepping to make sure that this turned out as fantastic as it did. I think they all just did a phenomenal job. Um, if you guys have anything that you think I should, I don't know, know, or if you disagree with me, if you agree with me, what are your thoughts on this? You let me know. Like I said, check out this guy's video. It was great. And um, yeah, that's it, man. Have a good morning, afternoon, or night. Stay safe. And uh, I'm going to see you in the next one. Peace.